Does anybody have any idea what this talk is about? <laughs> or how important it is? <laughs> this is, this in my opinion is the real important work. Um, so, normally I would just give you the boilerplate, but you know what, I'll do it anyway. Um, so the emergency exits are all around you. The normal entrance is where you came in and the normal exit is directly behind you because everything you want to do is directly behind you. There is nothing that way. There's a talk that way but you got to get in line for it and that's hot. Yeah, the outside is that way. You don't want to go that way. Um, so I think I'm, yeah, my time is quickly closing. I'm going to just go ahead and hand it over to Far to uh, blow your minds. Thank you, folks. I don't know about any mind blowing, but uh, hopefully I will freak a few people out. Um, I've lost some business, so hopefully I'll get some business back. <laughs> yeah, better? Yes. Okay, I can hear myself. Uh, so, okay, I guess all of these are kind of, uh, I'm obligated to tell you who I am and what I do. Um, I hack stuff for IO Active. Uh, I don't re really know how to categorize what I do. I just kind of find weird stuff, play with it, try to find where the relevance is in some piece of uh, what we do for business. Um, I'm not really good at uh, sort of being the professional security guy, but as it says, I know how the pixies flow. Um, I tend to be pretty good at uh, looking at the security interface, the physical security interface for embedded systems when it comes to how electricity, electrons, noise, RF and stuff like that get used. Uh, and most importantly, I'm not interested in hacking one thing. Um, if I'm going to hack some stuff, I want to hack all the things. Um, so this means I don't want to just find a buffer overflow in something, I want to find an unpatchable, unfixable buffer overflow that no one can do anything about. And if I can, write my name on it. Um, anyway, also, uh, as it says, I'm a local, or an amateur lock picker. I'm not very good. Uh, I've tried cracking safes and things like that. I can't really crack safes the old fashioned, like listening with a stethoscope kind of way. Um, but I thought this would be a really fun way to kind of, uh, put my stamp on lock picking. Uh, so without getting sort of too into the weeds, uh, we're going to talk about some of the previous high security lock designs and really how similar they are and why the attack that I've been working on is kind of a systemic flaw in pretty much every lock design by Kaba uh, and may exist in many other designs. Uh, we're going to talk about how the locks kind of evolved from sort of point to point and sort of look at the security boundary as far as electrons go. Um, I'm going to have some schematics up here. They're not really schematics. They may look like schematics. They are block diagrams. <laughs> uh, they're really just to kind of talk about where that security boundary is between locks. Uh, and then of course I'm going to whine about secure disclosure a bit because uh, everybody's whining at me about it. So for, for these locks, uh, the, the most important things to know are kind of, kind of these bullet points. We're trying to make an electronic lock, a thing that's exactly like the old lock that replaces the old one exactly, the mechanical brass made machine thing. But we want to replace it with electrons and pixies because those are more secure. They have secure in them. Um, so all the requirements we have here, they need to be long lived. We don't want any batteries in them. Um, but now that we're making them electronic, we want uh, tiered permission schemes, multiple users, time windows, all kinds of interesting things like that. Um, and because of all of these things, these locks are going to be more secure. We're sure of it. There's no real reason why. We've just made them electronic. Um, so this is your basic lock design. Uh, if you were going to put something together with an Arduino, this is probably what you'd do. Uh, you'd probably use an internal EEPROM, but whatever. You have an external EEPROM, you have some place to store the personality of the lock, the actual individual stuff. You have a microcontroller that's got to do the interfacing with the real world. Uh, if I want to be long lived, I've got to have something power me externally. And you kind of see this little dotted line, I'll use that in all my schematics to kind of show the privilege boundary of the lock. So anything that's on the, the right hand side of that dotted line is going to be something that is available to an attacker. Everything on the other side is theoretically inside the physically secured safe. Okay, so we've added some security to our design. 
we're basically doing the same thing that uh, they did in smart cards where we're trying to use the power line as our communication line. So we'll just, we'll power ourselves off of that internal IO line, uh, store that in a capacitor, put a diode in there so you can't glitch me out and done. Let's call it over. And that's what Cyberlock did. Um, I'm just gonna beat Cyberlock over the head really quickly because I think it's interesting because uh, every single one of their door indoor cylinders were beatable with bullshit crypto. Um, and when I did the analysis, actually let me go back to that real quick. You can actually see, I love this little quote right here. I just kind of threw this in the original advisory. You could probably extract the private key through power analysis, but I don't really think it's worth the effort. <laughs> this is the actual power trace that's in the report and you can actually see between the A1 and A2 markers, there's kind of a little bit of a wiggle at the top of that line. And that's actually the microcontroller transferring its internal EEPROM contents into the microcontroller as the lock gets powered up externally. And that's pretty much our target for, for at least this presentation. So, you know, we've seen basic pluses and minuses, don't need batteries, have an auto trail, have all those special security things. Um, but of course we started with bullshit crypto. <laughs> we started with making it reliant on external power sources and the, you know, basically attacker provided power. And of course we made sure that they couldn't be firmware updated or anything. So once they're in the door cylinders, every single door cylinder has got to be replaced. Um, <laughs> So this is, this is kind of a little bit of a quick tangent. I'm not gonna beat on this too much. Um, as a result of the cyber lock work, uh, I got one of my, I wanna say first, but just most recent uh, DMCA cut your shit out letters. And uh, I just, I find it really annoying that working in electronic locks that this is the response that we get now when sort of, you know, 200 years ago, the idea of perfect security and the likelihood that a lock was going to be broken at least was somewhat accepted. People were looking to try to figure out where the, the reality of that lock security is. Uh, but now with sort of the inherent encroachment of software security in this area, uh, we're starting to see the same sort of strategies from software security. Sue them, threaten them, claim it's not a problem. Um, I'm okay with claim it's not a problem, but sue them, threaten them, claim that they've, they've violated some sort of code of ethics by not going to the government first, um, which we did. Um, you know, that kind of stuff is really starting to get annoying. And that's my quick tangent on that. We'll, we'll, we'll put a pin in that and get back to that. <laughs> There's another lock design that you start seeing that's a pretty common one. This is your, your standard home safe. Um, this is kind of the thing that you might have in your hotel room, in fact. <laughs> um, these lots have actually been pretty thoroughly beaten. Anytime you have any sort of external power source, you just threw together some really shitty code, you're gonna introduce timing flaws, you're gonna introduce some interesting power analysis, and um, I think both of these guys did, guys did some, some really good job. If Plora is out there, I owe him a beer somewhere. If Dave is out there, I probably owe him a beer, whatever Australians drink. Um, <laughs> I know, it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> But this lock design is pretty obvious, right? We have the battery on the outside. We know that we can measure current flow from the battery. If you're gonna steal pixies from the battery, of course I can measure current flow from you. You've also given me a ground. Of course I can reference myself to your internal circuit. And you know, we, we've kind of learned that these kind of designs are cheap. They're, they're really easy to crank out there. You don't have to have software experts. You just throw it together really quick, but it's still reliant on external power. And then we've introduced these, at least two side channels in this new design. I don't believe either of these lock designs have really done anything to update that. <laughs> so, okay, what, what, what are we doing with these kinds of locks in other places? And this is where I get to my other quick tangent of things that I really enjoy working on. ATMs. Um, it turns out that ATMs also use combination safes. And uh, here's, here's another guy, I owe a beer too. Um, I really love this video, if you want to go look it up online, it's the greatest thing ever. He basically spends a full minute talking about how in the old days, attackers would try to go through the safe door to steal the money. Makes sense, go the straight through to, to get that money. Um, but then goes on to explain how malware seems like a much more reasonable way to steal money these days. Um, I kind of figured, what, why not? Let's look at that lock. This thing is everywhere. And I did some work for a customer and it turned out their ATM lab had every single ATM had one of these locks on it. Didn't know how ubiquitous they were until I started looking. So it turns out this lock design is kind of full. We have, uh, you can't really tell the difference here between a Gen 1 and a Gen 2, but we have basically two different versions of this SendCon, and we have an AuditCon, and we've got all this bank keying stuff, these little, little tiny uh, eye button devices that, look at it, just looks like security. It looks superficial, you gotta use your eye button and everything to get in, it's, it's two part authentication. And this is more or less what you're looking at schematic wise. It's, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, 
just to kind of go over really quick and dirty what the, the interesting bits are. Um, we've got uh, self-generating power. So there's no power now external to the safe. They're just bringing power in by generating it with this little knob. It's my terrible drawing there. Uh, the knob generates power internally when the lock has enough power. It'll boot up and happily display things on the LCD and you can input the code and, and do things with it. Um, but I can't directly measure the current flow here, right? The battery's on the inside. How do I, how do I even look at this? But it turns out if you take the same approach, also here's the uh, the audit con, not too different. Uh, if you take the same approach and look at both of these, um, you know, power and ground lines, you can more or less see a stable voltage. But if you AC uh, bias that signal and take a look at the very tiny wiggles at the very top of that signal and amplify the fuck out of them, um, you end up getting that same side channel back, even though you're not drawing power from these insides. It's, it turns out that having power drawn from the outside of the safe. Uh, is enough to kind of make that current flow variation work out. Uh, just skipping over those real quick. Uh, these are kind of the insides of the safe, just so you can kind of get an idea of mechanically what they are. Uh, there's nothing too interesting going on with them. Here's the S2000 we'll do the proof of concept on. Uh, the audit con is very similar. The generation two, you can basically see they're, they're almost clones except for some new features have been added. Um, but you're looking at an 8051 microcontroller in the case of the audit con and the S2000. They don't even have the room for crypto in these things. Uh, the generation two is an MSP430, and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but digging through the patents for these locks, you can kind of see that they didn't really have an idea of what security really meant when you're trying to deal with these internal EPROMs. They basically talk about trying to mix and hide bits. Um, uh, you could probably extract all of the information necessary for doing something like the banking modes by looking through the patents, but ultimately you're dealing with anding, oring, exclusive oring, nothing too fancy to generate a combination from the internal authentication data. Um, this is uh, basically what you're looking at internal. So in this case, we're talking about the S2000 lock. Uh, we're getting a little bit into the actual attack that I'm going to show a proof of concept for. And this is fairly consistent along a lot of the locks. Um, you have the parts of the EEPROM that the lock would read as it's trying to read its uh, identity. Uh, you can see the second hex line, the OX200 address starts with value two um, in the first case. So that's a shelving mode lock. And the other one below it is 05, that's a bank mode lock. Um, but basically these three authentication fields are all that make it up. It doesn't, everybody sort of focuses on the fact that I'm working on the simplest version of uh, the lock configuration, but regardless of the lock configuration, it still has to read these same EEPROM contents, and these same EEPROM contents provide everything necessary for generating combination regardless of the mode. Uh, it might just be that, as you can see here, an I button is required to identify itself to the lock. You would need to figure out what that I button number is, which is also stored in the external EEPROM, uh, and you'd have to emulate it with, uh, Arduino library. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. But as far as getting the power out, okay, or, or as getting the uh, the actual data out, this is pretty much what we're looking at. This is the actual side channel, or at least one version of the side channel that we're looking at, um, along with the actual data that it represents. Um, when we first looked at the lock, I thought I had this thing beat because we're looking at the soft I2C section. You just look at the first few bytes of that transfer. <laughs> In this particular side channel, because it's I2C, soft I2C, the edges between the clock and the data line are not perfectly aligned. So the timing signature between them is slightly offset. And then your data looks as though it's been Manchester coded. If you see three blips, you go transfers from a zero to a one. If you see another three blips, it transfers from a one to a zero. Um, and uh, you dig a little bit further, and it turns out I can't do that. Um, that only works for the microcontroller talking to the EEPROM. <laughs> If the EEPROM's talking back, those edges are simultaneous. Uh, but after spending a little bit of time filtering and sort of poking at it, uh, it turns out that the ones are sort of preferentially leaked on those high, sharp edges. All right? You can, you can sort of see in both of these as the, it goes from a one to a zero and a zero to one on that clock edge, there's these high frequency spikes that sort of happen. Those high frequency spikes like to leak out. They're, they're very high frequency, they've got lots of harmonics. If there's a frequency they can leak out on, they will. Uh, and that's how I wrote the first proof of concept, in fact. Um, but because I had no faith in that actually working on stage here, uh, I rewrote the proof of concept uh, to work against sort of the lower frequency data set of the side channel. Uh, so in this case, uh, you can actually line the bits of what the actual, this is actually the clock track, not the data track. 
Um, but then you have the powered trace aligned perfectly with that clock track. Can anyone tell me which ones are ones? Right? Can you pick that out by, by hand? Um, so I think that's basically where I'll get to my proof of concept real quick, uh, just to prove that I can actually do that automatically. But I don't think anybody should really focus on the idea that I can do it with an automated script since this is basically what it looks like if you spent the time to align the traces, you can extract that signal by hand. Uh, so let's, let's see if we can pull this off by hand first. Uh, you're not gonna play. So just so you can see, uh, this is my S2000 here. I don't really have anything going on except uh, oscilloscope probe jammed in the data port, uh, the actual I button port. And if everything goes well, uh, I'm gonna hit uh, a single just to get a single trace. Uh, I may have to boot the, uh, boot the lock a couple of times, but we'll just get a quick power trace. That one kind of looks okay. I'm, I'm not sure that one will decode, but let's find out if that one will decode. Come on, work with me here. Gestures. Ignore that. Let's uh, quickly. Of course, this is not going to go quickly. Or LF POC. Download from the scope real quick. If not, I will just switch to a pre captured. <laughs> Yay, oscilloscope downloads. Uh, so once this downloads, we'll just uh, run it through the low frequency POC script. Uh, it already knows what the alignment uh, for each of the edges of the square wave should be. Uh, and ultimately, what the, this is the actual proof of concept code right here. Uh, so what this guy is actually doing is once we've gone in to find where the byte offsets are from the trigger point, um, we synchronize using the high frequency data from the, the actual lock itself. Sorry? Oh, you're not even seeing the, the download. Shoot. Let me, uh, aha. So this is the actual uh, proof of concept code. I apologize. Didn't know you couldn't see that there. I'm bad at this. Uh, so these are the actual byte offsets. Um, we're using the high frequency data in the signal to actually create an alignment. Uh, so we just filter for everything above 100 megahertz. We get some nice sharp spikes. We use those sharp spikes to create our zero alignment. From that zero alignment, we calculate our byte offsets. From each byte offset, we have a clock edge. And ultimately, what we're calculating is the difference in power consumption between the positive going clock edge and the negative going clock edge. If that rises above a certain threshold, then that's, that was a one that got transferred. Um, this looks really dirty, so we'll, we'll give that a try. <laughs> I'm just going to do that one. Let's just do the capture I did earlier so that I don't have to have a heart attack anymore. Where's it at? Where's it at? Where's it at? Unfortunately, Looks like my signal was clipped out of the top a little bit and clipped out of the bottom. You might just have to do a recapture. Uh, but this is ultimately what we get when we, oh shoot, 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 shoot. We're bringing all these little windows over here. <laughs> these are the little windows that actually decode the data. The output is actually this guy right here. You can actually see, so this is the expected data that we would see internally with this being the lock mode and then these three bytes actually being the shelving mode combination. And you can see we have a lock that is in fact in shelving mode. 
with combination 112233. And for whatever reason, it's in hex. I don't, I don't actually know why. <laughs> um, we're also going to miss a few bits here. Let's see if I can actually get this. Yeah, we missed a bit there. You can kind of see there's a little bit of a spike of noise in our waveform. Um, but you can pretty much always see when you lose this bit in the waveform. Uh, there's nothing too insane about uh, sort of manually parsing it. So the problem is creating a simple rule for how to threshold that bit out. It's not exactly easy. Um, so don't concentrate too much on the fact of creating an automated script for this kind of thing. Uh, so to maybe get back to the slide deck a little bit. Um, the, uh, once, once the lock is actually booted and you have these three authentication fields, uh, all your actual side channel attack has to do is extract what those three fields are and from that point you can calculate for any of the generation one locks uh, what the opening and closing, clo closing codes for those safes should be. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, any CENCOM generation one safes that are actually in deployment are basically dead. Um, they're, they're not safe. The <laughs> Let's do this a little bit story wise. When we reported this vulnerability to Kaba, um, there was a few things that happened. First, we found out that we reported them to the wrong Kaba. <laughs> You'll laugh, but this is going to be a really funny detail. Uh, that guy, Kaba, was like, no, great, you did some great work, we really appreciate it. Um, I'll pass this off to the other team that actually works on these locks. Um, he said, we only work, we only make government locks. Um, we make the X09 series. Uh, so I googled the X09 series and actually found some really interesting stuff. Um, uh, the X09 series actually looks like it has a similar design to these CENCOM locks. It's made almost identically, same, uh, the same design pattern. Uh, we told him this, uh, maybe your locks might also be affected by this design pattern issue. And he said, S you don't have the authority to test these locks. <laughs> if, if you are doing any research on an X10, the feds will be after you and whoever sold it to you. Okay. Uh, we then went off and notified our banking customers uh, and they said immediately, well, what about generation two? Uh, there's a generation two? <laughs> Don't know anything about it. I guess I'm going to have to go buy some. Uh, so at the same time, I found out about generation two and I found out about the audit con, which is used in pharmaceuticals, um, weapon storage, anything you, you might want to have, sort of an audit trail for the number of people, maybe a, multiple people who are allowed to access that. Uh, the Autocon just falls to this vulnerability. There's a master code. The master code is directly read from the EEPROM, so there's no banking mode or any dicking around with any sort of I buttons or anything. You can just put in the master code once you've extracted that and that guy will open. Uh, generation 2, you can actually see from the power trace. I can extract that shit. That's easy. It's loud. It makes lots of noise. Um, but when I spent a little bit of time with it, it turns out that it actually does seem to try to use encryption internally to prevent you from pulling off this attack. So either they knew that this was a possibility or they were just suspicious that it was a possibility. Um, and I'm going to put a pin in that. Oh, you know, you know what? Let's get to that. <laughs> and now while I can't totally tell you about what happened with the Gen 2, while I was getting my shit together for this presentation, uh, I decided to go and look back through the Gen 2 and rather than saying that, yeah, it might still be vulnerable to other side channel attacks, power analysis or something like that. But at that point, if I've got to do multiple traces and I've got to average traces and stuff, this is probably sufficiently secure for what it is. Um, but in putting it together, I decided to see what would happen if I switched. You know what? I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I decided to see what would happen if I did a little bit more poking at the locks. Um, and in poking at the locks, I discovered um, that the side channel does open them up to uh, um, undocumented flaws. <laughs> Uh, and if you can trigger some of these undocumented flaws like the one that I have on the screen, you can look as much as you want in the SendCon documentation for the generation two, you won't find that. Um, the locks will happily reset themselves to factory condition. Uh, which means they have a combination of 50, 25, 50 and that's just pretty much that. Uh, so while the gen two, <laughs> so while the gen two does defend itself against, uh, uh, against the sort of base side channel attack, um, that the, the, uh, the generation one went down to, the generation two may in fact be more vulnerable in sort of differing ways. It's, it's kind of fascinating. Um, but you are probably for the moment somewhat safer with it. I don't know what to tell you. It <laughs> so we're done. Let's, let's disclose this shit. Let's get to DEF CON. You guys would be happy with an ATM opening vulnerability, right? Like, that'd be good enough. Um, but we kind of left this hanging thread of the DOD locks. Uh, so I got myself. <laughs> I got myself uh, an X07 first because they're the oldest and cheapest and you know it's a, it's a hard bit of a lock. Um, uh, we'll just, we covered this. It's a hard bit of a lock. Um, and this is going to be a fun video in a second. 
it, it actually denies me a lot of the electrical grounding and electrical signaling that the other locks sort of present because they have the keypads and things on the outside. Somebody has really sort of threat modeled uh, the XO series of locks and not only designed to be physically secure but also try to make them somewhat electronically secure and you can actually, we'll, we'll look at some images but they've kind of switched back and forth over uh, the years on different design aspects of them where the generator sits on the inside or the outside of the lock, <laughs> external where the attacker can get it or inside where it's completely RF shielded. Um, but before I talk about the XO series, a lot of you guys don't know what the XO series is. And because I am constantly shitting on people who FUD, <laughs> I'm not gonna FUD. <laughs> I'm just gonna play this video, which hopefully you guys can hear the audio from. Alright. No? Audio? Somebody? There we go. Cabo Boss is proud to announce the newly designed X10. The secure tradition continues. With nearly one million locks sold, the Cabo Moss XO series is the choice for securing the U.S. government's most sensitive materials. In the Pentagon alone, there are several thousand XO series locks installed. The Department of Defense, Central Intelligence Agency, National Security Agency, and Air Force One all rely upon the Cabo Moss XO series to guard its most sensitive information. By the way, this includes the launch codes for the nuclear missiles on U.S. submarines. <laughs> so, the government was not pleased. <laughs> uh, this is probably one of the most passive aggressive I really hope you can read the text to this a little bit. One of the most passive aggressive sort of semi-threatening please stop your research le uh, letters that I've gotten. Um, under, under authority of the president, <laughs> you do not have the authority to test these locks. Oh, by the way, if you find anything, you should, you should, it's unacceptable for you to just tell the vendor you have to tell us. Uh, and then I love the CC list. And the only thing that ruins this letter for me is it says, Dear Mr. Ceruto. <laughs> Um, okay, so, so architecturally, this is what we're looking at with the, uh, oh yeah, this is the X07, right? So, uh, we only have the knob that breaches through the actual safe body and all we have is the LCD connector on the outside. Uh, and this LCD connector, you know, it's, uh, if you've ever driven, uh, an actual LCD, these signals are not anything that you'd consider friendly. There's no power, there's no ground, it's just sort of an AC signal. Um, they don't bring any ground outside the safe that I can even measure these signals really against. Um, also, <laughs> the locks are completely potted uh, because they don't want you getting inside. By the way, th you can remove this potting. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit also. <laughs> but the uh, further XOs kind of shifted the security boundary a little bit. They decided let's put the generator on the outside of the lock. Still, I don't have ground. That seemed to be a, some, a, some consideration that they had in not providing me that ground outside of the lock. So I, I really just have the AC signal from the generator knob and the AC signal from the actual uh, LCD signal itself. This is, by the way, two depotted, the X08 and the X09 depotted and sort of wired up for testing. Um, and yes, uh, both of these are also 8051 microcontrollers, so no room for crypto. Just nothing they can do in here. Um, and also the internal EEPROM we've confirmed are just clear text. Uh, so just to keep that in mind for similarity of attacks. <laughs> I, I hear a few people recognizing things. Um, so, <laughs> so if you actually look at these waveforms, you can kind of see why it's so hard to really, uh, like these are directly from the data sheet for the actual LCD driver chip that's inside these locks. Um, you can go back there. Uh, you can kind of see at any particular time any LCD segment may have full VCC, negative VCC, half VCC, half negative VCC or ground anywhere in there. And I'm trying to read this millivolt side channel out of there. Um, and more or less after I had the X07, I, I kind of dropped it. I, I just left it alone for a while. And you have one of those shower thoughts moments that uh, Mehdi's face perfectly represents here. Uh, how to recover the side channel from that lock. I need to separate the, the ones from the zeros. I need to separate the positive signals from the negative signals. And we have a thing for that. It's a bridge rectifier. <laughs> but normally we only use, you know, two, two poles of a bridge rectifier in your AC, normal AC circuit. Turns out you can just make a bridge rectifier with 20 of them. So, teeing off the LCD itself, link right here, 
you can actually just set up a whole bunch of shotkey diodes, <laughs> T the LCD out so the LCD will still continue functioning as normal. But now I have a ground to reference the signal, the VCC signal from the LCD itself against. And now I can read that internal VCC signal. Um, so let's see what we can find. <laughs> so this top trace is the actual full VCC signal uh, that you get off of the dial when twisting it. Keep a knob, I've, uh, keep in mind I've got to keep the knob together and everything because you have to rotate that knob to power the lock. Uh, so the beginning spikes you see here, if you can see my mouse, um, this is the actual knob rotation time right here, and that's why you have these high voltage, high-ish voltage spikes. Uh, and then suddenly right here is when the lock begins to get powered, and you can see it sort of slowly drawing from that internal voltage pool that it's got. And if we sort of zoom right in on this little spot right here, and take this little Savy logic trace right here, uh, that's ruining my surprise there, we can actually see that uh, we see these little high frequency spikes of bullshit garbage that perfectly line up with the actual data transfers internally to the lock. Um, and again, we know that the lock's internal EEPROM contents are not encrypted. If we bandpass that signal a little bit more and try to look a little bit closer, we can actually see the signal that we actually get is an inverted version of the actual data itself, just no more signal processing necessary. So I don't think you need to write, and it might even be hard to write a perfect exploit for this to just sort of threshold these values out. Um, but you can sort of see these two waveforms are inverted versions of each other. And that effectively allows me to extract the internal combination of the X07 or the X08 and the X09. Thank you. One of the things preventing you from doing this easily and stealing the nuclear codes um, is that the X08, the X09, and the X10 have some physical security aspects that make this somewhat difficult. Uh, you would have to remove, uh, if you kind of see in this uh, image here, I have to remove the front dial uh, to actually get to the lock internals to do that. Uh, to do that, you would have to defeat, have to defeat this snap ring. Uh, and that snap ring is intended not to come out once it is firmly in place. Uh, but it turns out it's only, that entire dial is really only kept on by a set screw. <laughs> so if you drill through the front of the actual dial and put a screw in through there to thread that little hole, you can push the screw in and back the entire knob off of the, uh, the dial that goes through. That's not a non-destructive attack, you've just drilled a knob to do this. Um, you, but it's, you know, it's definitely a problem in the lock design. Um, if you happen to bring a replacement knob, it, it would, you know, not leave any evidence. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm not going to claim that it's a non-destructive attack. Um, yeah, so in slides that uh, I had to add since uh, Bullshit Reuters articles came out, uh, <laughs> we called Kaba back and of course we told them that, uh, hey, so that lock you told me not to play with. <laughs> I, uh, I played with it, totally vulnerable. Uh, and he was very snippy. He didn't actually tell me to go fuck myself, but between the, he told me that uh, since the government is the only uh, person, uh, or the only uh, agency that receives the locks, uh, they will be the ones to respond. Uh, he's also the guy this morning that uh, questioned why I would present it to a group of hackers or hobbyists or whatever, rather than going to the government. I did you dick 10 months ago because of you. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that he actually alerted the government that we were doing it. He tried to call the government on us. So we kind of went down this road because he was a dick. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we called the government back. They actually turned out to be a bunch of nice guys, but this was all happening during the government shutdown. Um, <laughs> they seemed to think this was important enough to fly out to our offices, um, <laughs> which was one of the most awkward meetings that I have ever been in in my life. Uh, you don't know awkward until you've been in a meeting with a guy who will, who cannot spell the government without capitalizing the G. <laughs> Not joking. And with a hacker who's trying to put a challenge accepted meme in his slide deck for them. So. <laughs> but they, they turned out to be nice guys. Um, and ultimately uh, they went on to develop a mitigation for the XO uh, series of locks. Um, they asked if I could sign a non-disclosure agreement. Pretty much everybody has asked me to sign a non-disclosure agreement for this, but I'm fucking done with locks. So I want to do DEF CON. This is, this is how I can cathartically get rid of this entire line of research until someone shows me another bullshit lock. <laughs> um, 
I can call out some names there. Anyway, um, Medico. So, uh, <laughs> so we we also decided that um, since it would potentially be a crime for me to purchase the X10 lock. Uh, <laughs> and they seemed to warn me against buying it even though they agreed that I should probably look at it. Um, we kind of went our separate ways with them sort of saying, you know, we'll, we'll go talk to some folks and we'll see whether or not it's worth you looking at the X10, um, but don't buy one. <laughs> um, I decided to go look at the X10 and the only thing that I can tell the X10 does <laughs> is add a backlight display. Uh, when we were contacted again by the GSA, this is the only quote that I have to tell me how the X10 security is. <laughs> All right, so, so I guess I actually got through 47 slides in 40 minutes. Um, there may in fact be time for anybody to ask any questions if you could, you know, if you want to try. Nope. All right. Somebody has a question. Sorry. <laughs> Say that again. Uh, yeah, that is government talk for you'd be fucked. Um, I think that I think that what it means is uh, ultimately we've designed uh, we've tried to get people to understand this as a um, design pattern flaw, and uh, I think they acknowledged that and they went back and they were able to identify this pattern on their own and hopefully other lock manufacturers will as well. Uh, they just don't have as much money in them. Anybody else? Is there anybody I'm up? Fuck you. Is there anybody else? <laughs> All right. I am out of here. I'm going to go get a drink. I will be accepting joints. <laughs>